Okay, we are recording, and we have had some issues with uh, people saying that Patrick's not loud enough. So now I'm going to be very loud. He's still going to talk quietly, but we've raised his mic levels, which means there's probably going to be a little more ambient noise, but hopefully it's okay. Let us know if this is better, please. I like really the eye doctor. Really appreciate everyone's comments on YouTube and everything. It's like, it's very helpful and encouraging. We came back from oh, an epic weekend adventure. Um, <laughs> we got, oh shit, a bird just hit the window. The birds is coming. Oh, again. <laughs> um, the desert wants in. So, yeah, uh, uh, Patrick and I went on a, uh, I, I wanted to take him on my boat, Cape Moss, 1978 sleek craft, named after Cape Moss because she's made in the 70s, very sleek, very sexy, a little bit of a cocaine vibe, a little worn out, but still super hot. <laughs> Kate, if you're listening to this, I'm just teasing. Um, anyway, uh, we went to the Colorado River and I told Patrick that, you know, often things don't go exactly according to plan. Um, but that was an understatement this time. And, uh, and you know, I found that I, we didn't know each other that well before you moved here. Um, you know, we'd hung out a few times. We knew we had a, uh, you know, a connection on an intellectual level and liked to hear each other speak, <laughs> obviously, or we wouldn't be doing this. But then our connection has gone much deeper because, you know, first of all, our um, shared kind of uh, propensity towards uh, uh, non-traditional relationship types. And then, so that was a nice surprise to see that we kind of fit this kind of way of life very well. And then now going on this adventure and seeing that how, how well we dealt with uh, the really unexpected adversity. I'd love to hear you tell a little bit of what happened this weekend from your point of view. Well, you learn a lot about things when they break down and they suddenly come into focus, right? Yes. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I just think it's funny. So there's the version of things that you imagine, and then there's the version of things as they happen. And then there's the version of things as you tell, as you tell it in the story. And then there's the version of a thing that you tell over Instagram. And it's also very different because I got, um, like someone I know that you don't even know watches your stories to find out about me, uh -huh. right? Your Instagram stories. And they were just like, oh, that looked like such a magical weekend. And I'm like, well, you know. Is that bird again? The bird again. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just the version of the, the, the like snapshots versus the snapshots as they're, as they're shared and spread out the, into the world versus the snapshots of what will be our memories of the thing, right? right? So what I find really enjoyable is the idea that when things, if you have a ritual and that ritual goes perfectly according to previous plan and it's just kind of like redoing the same thing again, your brain's not going to encode it. It like if it, if it was perfectly the same, it wouldn't encode it because it, it it encodes differences. And so, like I'm going to remember this trip for a while because every possible thing that could have gone wrong, we like you know had to roll into neutral to a gas station twice for different reasons. The propeller didn't really work. Didn't know how to get on, and we were totally lost driving around in the dark because the engine was overheating. And like. Each of those moments were kind of like shared trauma in which we bonded, in which we learned about how we respond not to situations that are ideal, but situations that are challenging, right? Yeah. And it's equally important how someone responds to a challenging situation versus an ideal situation. Yeah. To, to go into delve into a little more detail, I have a 1992 Ford F-150 pickup truck with 325,000 miles on it and a sock and a shoelace <laughs> <laughs> we were we were driving and there's this little area where you're really in the middle of the desert there's only one uh gas station with like 50 miles in each direction it's called roy's diner you've probably you know if you live in california you've probably seen this iconic motel sign and this old gas station without any credit card things or anything and 10 miles before that gas station suddenly my nightmare of, you know, I start to smell radiator fluid and then sure enough, the temperature's climbing and then it red lines. So I pull over and 
the fan had hit the, the, the kind of hose that takes the, the, the fluid through the radiator. And it just made like a little hole about this big, like a little button sized hole. And it was just spewing out all the radiator fluid. So we tied a sock around it and then tied a shoelace around the hose to pull it up and then used all our drinking water to refill the radiator. Middle of the desert. We gave we gave all our water to the horse. It was like 110, <laughs> 110 degrees, middle of the day. We were so wanting to just be on the on the Colorado River and this was, you know, obviously not going to happen. Also the night before I had beseeched Patrick and Melody to go to sleep, but that didn't happen. They went to bed about five in the morning. Luckily, I was on a good night's sleep with uh, my date and we had, um, we had, uh, anyway, so there was a little bit of sleep between us and we, so we, we, we used this water and we, 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 we know that the, the gas station is about eight miles away. The sock lasts about six of those miles and the rest, I just kind of hit the accelerator, turn off the car and then we just roll into Roy's. And, um, at this point, there's no mechanic there or anything. It's Sunday. We're fucked, it seems. But I find this guy who lives in this little motel room there who runs the place. And I said, can we just look through your old vehicles here? There's a bunch of like rotting old cars and see if we can find a hose that might be similar. Now, mind you, I am not a mechanic. I don't usually fix things. I, 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 I have a high tolerance for breakdowns. I have a little bit of creativity with these things, but I'm not very good with my hands with these. But... We do find a hose that's almost the same size. And the only tool that he has is this big knife that he carries. And so he cuts the hose. And luckily this guy, brilliant, said, well, instead of replacing the hose, since this one's a little too small, we can just cut the two ends of the hose that was there and slide them in and then use duct tape around this new contraption. And then the, sh the said shoelace from before to hold it up and make sure that it doesn't hit the fan anymore. And right as we're trying to do this, our other two friends who are supposed to, we had given up on them joining us, but a friend of mine who shall remain nameless for reasons soon to be seen, um, arrives with a very similar boat, not having slept at all, zero, and very high in a Hunter S. Thompson style way, and um, bottle of whiskey in hand. Yeah. They were, they were they were leaking whiskey in the same way that we were leaking radiator fluid. Exactly. <laughs> they pull up mechanically inclined, but not at this particular moment. Let's like a retired, semi-retired mechanic. Yes. But somehow, basically, this, this thing works. And the two boats and the two cars pull out of Roy's. And um, three out, two hours later, we make it to the Colorado River and... Neither of the boats work. At which point, both boats break. <laughs> both boats break. <laughs> We're supposed to have this vision of the two boats going together, both these 1970s. I convinced my friend to name his boat um, Lauren Hutton, since mine's Kate Moss. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I don't even think we should maybe say the thing that he did that was so shocking. Yeah, no, probably not. Yeah. We should talk about... Highly... Yeah, go ahead. About, <clears throat> like... It's of no, let this not be a metaphor, but like how the, how we were felled by a tiny, tiny hole in a leak in a thing in a tube, right? I mean, so what I want this episode to be titled is breakups and breakdowns, right? Yes, and, and also breaks too. I thought breaks, breakups, maybe it's too many breaks, but I was thinking about just breaks in general. Breaks, breakups, and breakdowns, but go on. And it, And it's just so funny how easily like <clears throat> when you give when you when you tell a story about how why something went wrong or how it went wrong right we're, we're here now the day after or two days after like talking about how and what went wrong and like we're 99.9% .9 sure the fan caused a little tiny little hole but the idea that this four people in a large you know modern horse truck just are completely felled every single thing by by this uh, millimeter sized hole that effectively can be replaced or jimmied or like MacGyvered into into fixing. But like, why is it the case that there aren't more redundancies in our machines, in our relationships, in things where like, you know, at the tiniest of things can completely cause four orders of sequential magnitude, just breakdowns to the point that the engine explodes because of this tiny leak, right? And obviously like 
it's too easy to say like pressure and steam are building up and releasing and not in the right way and map that onto all kinds of relationships. There's, there's two ways of seeing that, that this, that these tiny details look. Cause I remember being under the influence of nitrous oxide in the dentist's office and, and all of a sudden having this revelation that all of this building and all of the expertise of this man who was fixing my tooth and all the people and all the machinery and everything all was like the universe conspiring to fix this tiny little detail like you would think like who cares a tiny little hole in one tooth of one insignificant human right and yet all of this works to kind of like fix and i, I had the, the the nitrous revelation was like that the universe was like this almost fractal um you know machine that delights in fixing itself in the most minute ways you know and just kind of this this evolution happening and you know it, it's it's very interpretive right we could say like wow you know you can be taken down by a toothache and your whole world no matter it'll dominate your consciousness like nothing else yeah and so you could use it for a pessimistic worldview which would be the biggest or 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 a view that the world is life is absurd right, right? like we have to like attend to these little holes like you said and it and can just almost ruin us but there's this other way of seeing it which is my kind of pathologically optimistic way of seeing things sometimes maybe but the fact that all of this effort can also come together to repair this and and the way we were so in you know it was just so much ingenuity and like creativity that happened and then we all bonded over this experience and we all felt so good pulling out of there in a way that we never would have had 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 the truck just worked right yeah yeah so there's this uh robert nozick <clears throat> this philosopher who has this thought experiment called the experience machine right mm -hmm. which is um if some like tricky mad neuroscientist created a chair and in the chair this kind of precedes the matrix and the philosophies around like are we living you know the, all that simulation bullshit um and it's the the experiment the thought experiment is just simply if there was a chair that you could go inside and the neurosurgeon would kind of tinker with things and tinker with your brain so as to create the subjective experience of a perfect ideal life would you choose that would you choose to go into the machine and most people's response when they first hear this question is no because actually life life is in, about some of that suffering some of that suffering or the the things that go wrong um could you know create the greatest degree of happiness create the most complete life to which the obvious response is well that would just be built into your experience of the subjective experience machine of the ideal life but it is very interesting this like what happens when everything goes right and how just goddamn boring that is yeah there's this old twilight zone episode about a kind of like greasy con man who is addicted to gambling and sex and women and ends up wakes up in like a suite kind of in a vegas reno maybe atlantic city kind of thing and everything seems fantastic. He has everything he wants. He goes into the casino and every slot machine turns up a winner. Every card game, he wins every single, every single machine game experience in the thing he wins. And he realizes that he's in hell, not heaven, that by virtue of his addiction requires discomfort, yeah. right? The gambler's addiction, they, they get more addicted, not when they win, but when they lose. Yeah. And so I feel very much like our, our kind of weekend of travails and, uh, inconveniences and inelegance it was I don't know I, I I you just learn you learn more you get more you extract more out of life and even your brain learns more lessons when things go right and wrong in combination in a certain ratio and obviously I mean we made it we were fine we had contingency plans you know this isn't a real like we weren't crossing the border with coyotes yeah. at our tail no of course of course they're all uh, you know very much you know, first world problems, as they say. Um, but there are there's a difference between people who are willing to tolerate a certain degree of breakdown in order to live a more full experience. Just having an old car is is an example of that in right. general, right? I've always had I've never paid more than five thousand dollars for a car, and everybody thinks like I have these fancy nice cars and stuff, but they've always just been. You know, my favorite car is an old Jaguar that I had. I paid three thousand dollars for it. Everybody was like, "Oh, what a fancy!" You know, but, but most people just don't have the tolerance for the breakdown, so they won't buy that car, right. right? Well, it's currently broken down right outside and unusable, right? Well, yeah, because the brakes, <laughs> the brakes stopped. Working. Well, you need those occasionally. <laughs> yes, um, and that can be pretty frightening when the brakes don't break. Um, 
so then we yeah we arrived finally we got one of the boats working and i've never uh i've never sailed what, what is the word for sailing when it's not a sailboat motored the boat um putzing 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 around <laughs> pottering uh, I, so I've never I've never taken the boat out at night because there's no I mean there's a couple of little lights to you know illuminate the boat for others but there's no way of illuminating the water but there was an almost full moon and by the time we left the uh, the the harbor we thought harbor is an exaggerated word but um, we thought let's try and find our favorite campsite which is 30 miles up the river and it's nighttime and now there's six of us on the boat because we've consolidated the passengers into one boat and we start up and we're in the middle of the Colorado River and we're going we're about 10 miles up everything seems wonderful and suddenly the boat just dies and I look at the temperatures all the way up same as the truck and... that, that was a nice kind of rhyming moment where <laughs> both of us <laughs> we're on the cool water we're literally surrounded by you know coolant and this thing still can't and the Everything's way a, overheating. A, the boat works by pulling up water into the motor from whatever body of water you're in and then circulating it through. And there's a thing called an impeller, which pulls the water up. And um, luckily, the two crazed drunkards who were with us had sobered up enough to kind of like figure out what might be wrong. And we, we waited 45 minutes, swam, ate. I, I really thought we might end up sleeping six of us on this little yeah, boat. We had started breaking out the mattresses yeah. prepared. <laughs> and um, we swam a bit. We ate, we drank, we started up the boat again. And, you know, at the, if we kept the speed low, we figured out that actually the temperature would stay at a tolerable so let, place. Let this not be a metaphor. Um, sometimes you just need time. Yeah. In the, in the worst of the worst, when things are so overheated that you can't even go forward anymore without danger of exploding the engine 40 feet into the air, uh, you just need time. You need to let things cool off. Right? Or you need to let things heat up because all this is happening on the backdrop of a break in my primary relationship as well, which um, I won't go into too much detail out of respect for her privacy, although she said she wants to be on the podcast. But there was an interesting thing where we had reached the point of too much comfort and too much predictability and um and when somebody because we're polyamorous and there was the possibility of new people entering the relationship when something new uh arrived for her um we decided that the best thing would be for her to pursue that and to take a break again this word break keeps coming up but the idea that uh who knows then what could happen would the break break the relationship or would it reinforce you know what we had and neither of us knew this and the unknown suddenly can provide a new take and a new longing and a new you know a new freshness right so it's it's interesting that let this be a metaphor <laughs> we'd want things we, there's a homeostasis we seek right we don't want things too cool we don't want things too hot uh, we don't want things too predictable. We don't want things too unpredictable, right? So we have this constant push-pull and everybody's obvious there. Everyone's homeostasis is different, right? Some people have a high degree, high tolerance for chaos and anarchy and unpredictability. And I think this goes down to like uh, uh, political also, you know, dispositions. And um, I remember the contrast in going back to Dreyfus's teachings and uh, Kierkegaard, one of the founders of existentialism, said that the only way you can have a meaningful life is to have an unconditional commitment to something. And that as soon as you find that unconditional commitment, whether it be it to another person in romantic love or in uh, to a cause or to some sort of like uh, anything that structures your life, suddenly the meaning doesn't just come from you. You have this kind of dialogue with the world and suddenly the world organizes itself around that. And the thing can't just be an ideal. You can't just be committed to beauty because that's that doesn't push back. You need some a commitment to something that's in the world and then suddenly your life is defined according to the what led up to it um, and according to this worldview you suddenly have a meaningful existence. And it was a very Christian point of view, although it could be abstracted outside of Christian Christendom, right? But the idea that Christ came down as a, 
as a unique human in time and in the world, um, you know, fit this kind of existentialist Christianity. So then Nietzsche comes along as wanting to overthrow that and famously declaring that God is dead. And he has this amazing little passage, which I found, I thought of this morning when we thought we were going to decide we we're going to talk about this, which is opposed to the idea of the unconditional commitment and but also not interested in perpetual improvisation because that is also completely meaningless uh if you're just responding to each impulse and each desire as it comes we just become, we're just like animals basically right uh or worse like there's so so i just want to read this very quick passage called it's from the gay science which is my favorite nietzsche book and it's called brief habits and he, uh, Nietzsche says, I love brief habits and consider them an inestimable means for getting to know many things and states down to the bottom of their sweetness and bitterness. My nature is designed entirely for brief habits, even in the needs of my physical health and altogether as far as I can see at all from the lowest to the highest. I always believe here is something that will give me lasting satisfaction. Brief habits too have this faith of passion, this faith in eternity and that I am to be envied for having found and recognized it. And now it nourishes me at noon and the evening and spreads a deep contentment all around itself and deep into me so that I desire nothing else without having any need for comparison, contempt or hatred. But one day, and this is the important thing, it's time is up. The good thing parts from me, not as something that has come to nauseate me, but peacefully and sated with me as I am with it as if we had reason to be grateful for each other, as we shook hands and say farewell. Even then, something new is waiting at the door, along with my faith, this indestructible fool and sage, that this new discovery will be just right, and that this will be the last time, that that is what happens to me with dishes, ideas, human beings, cities, poems, music, doctrines, ways of arranging the day, and lifestyles. Enduring habits I hate. I feel as if a tyrant had come near me, as if the air I breathe had thickened when events such as uh, take such a turn that it appears that they will inevitably give rise to enduring habits. For example, owing to an official position, constant association with the same people, a permanent domicile, or unique good health. Yes, at the very bottom of my soul, I feel grateful to all my misery and bouts of sickness and everything about me that is imperfect because this sort of thing leaves me with a hundred back doors through which I can escape from enduring habits. Now, most intolerable to be sure, and the terrible par excellence would be for me a, a life entirely devoid of habits, a life that would demand perpetual improvisation. That would be my exile and my Siberia. So I think this touches on a lot of things we've talked about both in this and other episodes, but the, the theme seems to be this kind of balance between letting the wor world exert enough force that it appears meaningful, but not so much so that it dominates us completely. So the enduring habit, which the way he sees the, it's like the, the way he would see the unconditional commitment that no matter what this thing is going to stay. So for one person, for Kierkegaard, that causes a, a more meaningful life. But I think in our contemporary kind of existence, we require at least people like us. I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people out there who want just the same thing every day. I don't yeah. know. What do you think from this? Well, the brain will encode, and it kind of all it ever does is encode contrast relative to its expectations. That's mm -hmm. all it does. The, the way to get, there's this classic like 80s figure that everyone uses in the dopamine neuroscience world, but the way, the way to get the largest net amount of dopamine flooding through the body, which does not just mean good or bad. Like there is no single emotion or valence associated with more or less. It's about, it's about how much contrast did j just occurred to you. Uh, and the way to do that is to condition someone, something, some group of neurons to expect something a certain amount of time after a stimulus comes in. It can be a bell, it can be a light, right? Just something ritualistic where you know what's gonna come when and then you deprive those neurons of that signal. You deprive the person of that. And then you give it to them at some unknown duration after. The moment of that unknown, the moment that it finally happens after having it removed, 
from your experience after having the prediction violated, that is how you cause the greatest amount of dopamine to flow through this little cluster of neurons. So it, this is to this point of, you know, too much ritual is not the most significant signal for the brain. If you do everything by virtue or rather in accordance with expectation, you're going to kind of flatline. You're going to have this homeostatic predictability where the brain knows what's coming and it knows how to prepare and it's never surprised. And this is neither good nor bad. Neither is the most amount of dopamine good nor bad. Um, it's just a signal of contrast and the brain is constantly trying to find these moments of contrast. And like, there are some animals, they're the little rabbits when they run around, they want their day to be exactly the same. They're basically living in 2020, like Corona lockdown every day of their life. They don't want things to be different. They want it to be immensely predictable because they are literally figuratively just above grass on the food chain. Right. And so the question is the kind of human that is more rabbit like or more just kind of completely spontaneous with respect to the kinds of like, do they derive happiness from the calm stillness of knowing what's coming next or not? Do they want landmarks like memory landmarks of times when life broke down? But, and as a consequence, like those are the moments you remember, right? Yeah. That, that's when we're looking back on this and we're both 80 sitting around a dining table or in our like hospice bed. This is the stuff we remember. We remember the breakdowns. We remember the dop dopamine signal that was a complete violation of the expectation and prediction. Yeah. And I think the most beautiful thing to, um, like orient yourself and point towards is things that you will remember because everything else you're kind of, if it goes away, if it goes away in your memory and the shared memory of the people around you, then it just kind of disappears into the ether. And it's only those moments of breakdown. But yeah, yeah, we need to create a container that allows, like, for example, you wanted to have this podcast. You said either let's do it every day or not at all. Right. So like, and yet when we come in here and sit down, we don't have a plan. So there's this, there's this great, I see it as a container within which the unknown can happen, right? Yeah. And it's the same with obviously we we need to have a structure of life of of deep enough friendships that will allow us to have these experiences and know that we have some degree of predictability with the people that we're with that we're going to want to experience this thing with this person. So it's this like backdrop of the known in which the unknown can happen. And that this is why I love this Nietzsche passage so much. It's like he's getting at these contrasting possibilities absolutely that yeah. we need we need habits but he, but you can't be all habit exactly exactly so then so then tell me about the boat you've been you've been out on that river before yes you uh, have been on that boat before you've been at that campsite before you've been at the various coves and places that you kind of wanted to show up show us right so there there was a world where everything had gone perfectly according to plan where you had lived that already yeah. and you'd be doing like a Groundhog Day, Edge of Tomorrow thing. Yeah, be like you'd be a tour guide basically. Yeah, you'd be a tour guide for your previous experience. Yeah, which it wasn't at all. And it made me so happy. It well, right. Me, yeah. and, and so then the thing is like, what would you have derived? What would you have gotten out of just showing new people a thing you've done before in accordance exactly with uh, uh, like just perfect smoothness? Like we would have been the contrast there. The contrast would not have been the boat you wouldn't have noticed the boat. You wouldn't have noticed the truck. You would have noticed us as the new people. Instead, the mechanics and the lubrication and the overheating and everything that went wrong in terms of putting certain fluids in places, right? Like that's basically what broke down every single piece of machinery. Just fluids were in the wrong place. And like the, by virtue of that, those rose to prominence in both your memory and your experience of the thing. And you got an experience that was not ritualistic. You got an experience that was not just deja vu relative yeah. to what you've done before. Even trying to find the campsite after everything was running, it's usually a one hour boat ride from, you know, from where we launch to where we camp and doing it in the day. It, I would, would have known how to recognize the place right. at night. It looks completely different. Yes. We had to look through, I think, eight different coves going and, in thinking, this is it. I'm sure this is it. And then all of a sudden, there's just some reeds and we're shallow and the propellers hitting the dirt and and then we're like crawling out and climbing up the mountain to try and find it and recognize it in the moonlight and and luckily again we were with people all of whom were enjoying this but you know by now it's like 1 a.m uh, you're shaking your head you weren't enjoying it or, I'm, I'm just 
go on. <laughs> I mean, obviously, at, at a certain point, we all wish that we would just be at the campsite, I think. But... So, th so there's a few things I found interesting about this. One, um, like I had, I had I crafted in my mind the first Instagram story I've ever crafted before. And it, what I really wanted was to have a small video of you every single time we entered a new cove being like, I think this is it. I think this is it. And then like a time lapse, like 30, 30 minutes later, I think this is it. 20 minutes later, I think this is it. But also two things. By far, my favorite uh, visual moment of the entire trip was one of those coves, one of the lost coves, one of the ones that was, was incorrect, it? Yeah, where we wound down this snaking river in the dark as, you know, I took my headlamp and tried to be like a lighthouse at the front of the boat. Yeah. And we were just illuminating these reeds and these gorgeous kind of angry toads and birds that were not used to being disturbed and bats. And it 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 felt kind of like a I don't know if you can have a peaceful apocalypse now, but it was effectively the stress of a one tenth of the stress of apocalypse now, just with all of the visual splendor. And then we just dead ended in this like field of reeds. And I love that when I'm looking, when I'm looking back in my, even like scanning through my memory, that is the thing that is richest in my memory. Yeah. And so like that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And so I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to kind of intentionally create those kinds of moments, right? Because we would never have planned to want to be out at night, completely lost with an overheated boat, not knowing where we're going. Right. Yeah. We would never have chosen that. Mind you, nobody else chooses this too, which is lovely. One of the nice things about COVID, this is the first summer of my life I don't go to Italy. And we've discovered this place in the Colorado River. You know, I, I didn't know about it a year ago. Um, and it's as beautiful as anywhere I've ever been. I, I've been. I've been very lucky to see a lot of beautiful places, whether it's, you know, sailing in Thailand or Aeolian Islands or Amalfi Coast or Balearic Islands. This is as as beautiful it, it's exactly on the same level of sublimity that's a word <laughs> sublimeness um and there's nobody else there i mean we saw like a couple other boats you know and like again people think the boat's fancy but you know it's under five thousand dollars again for like a little speed boat from the 70s and you can go you know i i, I will include our our little group of uh, podcast listeners in this um secret because it's incredible it's so fucking beautiful up there i mean like it's just yeah, it really it's a, the, and, and then you think you've seen it what's amazing about it, it again it's this fractal thing literally because you know the, the, the mandel brought sets where you go in and like there's these little coves and then within the coves there's other little coves and at night we also we hit a dead end on the river, which I didn't even think was possible, but because it was a giant cove and then within the giant cove, we'd gone into a smaller cove and we could no longer tell even which way we were facing. But anymore. let that not be a metaphor. It was a subjective dead end. We realized later it wasn't a real dead end. Yes. <laughs> we just had convinced ourselves that it was over. And um, so, so at each of these little coves you go in, suddenly you have a completely different landscape and different colors of rocks and the water goes you know you have places where and the temperature of the water changes so drastically from how high up the river you are because up by hoover dam it's taking the water from the bottom of lake mead which is right above it so the water is this even though it's 110 degrees out you have this 54 degree icy water and then uh, one little cove you exit and you walk up about five minutes and it's suddenly hot water coming out with these deadly amoebas that you get in your nose what is it called uh and foolery uh, there's a little sign about the amoebas that i was like i know patrick's gonna know about this and sure enough yeah. he's like had written about the amoeba yeah there are too many brain parasites in the world and that's one of the bad ones it's a hundred percent fatality rate you said right it's up there yeah <laughs> anyway yeah it's the and then, so of course, then there's people who just are thrill seeking for the sake of thrill seeking, and those are adrenaline junkies. And I don't think uh, that's 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 the perpetual improvisation that that uh, Nietzsche is referring to. The people who just want just the dopamine, just the adrenaline, at, at all costs. And I think that again, everybody has to gauge this for themselves. But hopefully not settle for something that where they avoid difficulty just because they don't want it, because they're afraid and 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 take on a little bit of chance and and again i think this this we've found our balance and it happens that it, we i think we have a similar 
similar tolerance and similar desire for novelty and similar um go ahead so what i found interesting was well actually <clears throat> there were moments when you were you had you had, you were the only one that had done this before and i found it really interesting where you were looking towards us to make a similar moment to one you had had previously in some sense and i think about this sometimes or i think about this quite a bit with new relationships or new people that enter into your life how much you try to recreate kind of prior experiences you take them to the same place you tell them the same stories like in the honeymoon get to know each other phase right or like not you one does yeah. i do everybody yeah, yeah. does and you kind of put on the airs of being your best self as you remember things working in the past uh -huh. and you try to take people yeah. to the same thing and have similar experiences or try to you know and effectively this is a generous act of sharing you want to share the best parts of yourself in your life and you want to share those that work but there's something so like there's there's something so affirming about two people being dropped both somewhere they've never been in the process of getting to know each other right there there are these moments that i love this film force majeure for this reason where you think you're going to act a certain way but you simply don't know until the thing actually happens there are people in the military that can do all the basic training camps i grew up on this navy seal base this is a common story um there are people that you know you can you can put them in practice simulated environments with a gun and with danger and stress all you want they can pass the navy seal training with flying colors but when you put them in an actual battlefield they just freeze right you don't know until it happens how people are going to react and you learn more than you can ever learn about someone in those moments of discomfort in those new novel moments than you can when they're embedded in their rituals they're embedded in the familiar and so like what i really wanted to do was almost like break you out of the like groundhog day loop yeah. that you might have ended up in if you were just like hosting us and and disappointed maybe if we didn't see it the same way or have the same thing and then but the the, the moments of breakdown all allowed that to be a new kind of thing for you and we all got to understand how we all acted in moments of discomfort and that was the what yeah it's what made it so fresh and it's true that in relationships when someone has too much of a go-to thing that they do that the other person's gonna feel it and yeah, it's gonna feel can... inauthentic because it's gonna feel like it's like a routine that works it's like a jazz musician who just Absolutely. plays a lick that they've played Absolutely. a thousand times they know it has a certain effect on the audience but you, if you really know you, you can feel it when it's truly improvised. And I can absolutely tell when I meet just, you know, just, when I just meet people, I can tell the stories when they've told the story before. Yeah. And when I do interviews, so I have like a journalistic hat and I do interviews and my greatest, um, uh, 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 like my MO, what I try to do is get people out of their autopilot stories as much as possible. Because you can, there's some small intonation difference where you can tell even when they're affecting like pauses, their pauses are just built into the way yeah. that they've told the story. It's, it's the same thing as taking someone on an experiential boat ride that they've been on before. They're just telling a story again in a way that's been told. But then before. there are people who are such good storytellers that you can hear them tell the same story five times and you're excited to see what they tell absolutely. differently, right? Right, but that, that's what we strive for as storytellers. Because we both do that too, obviously. Oh, we have 100%. stories. Oh, 100%. But I'm, I was excited to talk about this trip this weekend because neither of us has told this story before. Right, right. Right, so I was like both excited to see I was just, you know, excited to see how it would emerge, and of course, we're going to tell the story again to other people, and right. and uh, and different details will come out, and then you will find things that are, have more of an effect, and like, and and you'll use those. But again, I think it's it's very much like being a great musician. Like, if you can't pick up the guitar and say, "Oh, it's a brand new instrument." I've never played it before and do cool improvisations. You have to have a familiarity with mm -hmm. what you're able to do. You have to have a background skill level, uh, hopefully a background mastery. And then and then you have to understand the structure of the of the of the music that's being played. And then with that backdrop, if you're responsive to the unique situation and you're truly feeling this kind of like connection with the audience, with the other members of the band, with the, with the instrument, then something fresh and exciting can emerge. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's what happened this weekend, uh, hopefully. You know, like there was a, enough expertise that we didn't just get stuck and that we didn't just get lost, you know? So there was hopefully enough um, 
background skill level, but then there was also enough room for novelty that allowed it to be a totally unique and authentic experience. Yeah, yeah. And I and like how how much of this should come to bear? How much of these lessons should come to bear on like a new relationship or a new a new person, right? There's a there's kinds of mechanical breakdowns, there's kinds of relationship breakdowns. Let this not be a metaphor. Where um, let this be a metaphor. <laughs> where like they're just they're just flukes. They're they're by fiat. They're, the fate of the universe is is aligned against you. And then there are others that are just like poor maintenance. And there are others that are fluke poor planning based on environmental conditions interacting with you know uh, coincidence. And each one has like different lessons from it. You know, and and I just like I don't know how to perfectly navigate that kind of explore exploit ratio between the familiar and the new and where where it's it's very common story i've told before it's very common see if you can tell listeners uh it's very common for uh, uh various different like immune systems do this and various different birds foraging birds where if you have a, a kind of randomized within a grid but replenishing resource there's a, there's a search pattern that is optimal and this is true for immune cells or herons or uh, uh, people at disneyland and it's you spend a lot of time exploiting an area that you're in kind of like if you imagine like a heat map you spend a lot of time making very very small kind of foraging in a bush kind of things like you you check out the bush entirely and then every once in a while at some rate you want to just completely relocate and go to a new place and then start exploiting that place and this is how you find optimal like resources if you're a bee or if you're a heron and i feel like this maps well onto this kind of desire for ritual or desire for novelty and what is the proper ratio and what is the most memorable ratio, but what is also the ideal ratio for a well-lived life? And I, I just don't know the answer. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are improvising as we go. So so in my this primary relationship that I, and we decided to take a break from, uh, I think we realized that we were bonded more than we had cared to admit before possibly. and. We kept speaking all the time during this new relationship that she was on uh, in and exploring and then she said to me one thing that i found great she said the great thing about polyamory is that it, when you hear something the exact same thing from two people telling you that you have this habit or you have this thing that you do it's very easy when you it's one person to just dismiss them or rationalize it or something but when the two people are telling you the exact same thing it's time to face yourself right that yeah. it's, there, there's some tr uh, truth in you what's can get a there. second opinion yeah, exactly so for free for free well that, there's a price <laughs> that's some cost yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that could work in but, the inverse too uh i have a lover and she uh was engaged and i was laying with her one i think morning and she just got so upset at her phone Right, and I didn't know why. Just something like incredibly upsetting happened on her phone, and she had broken off the engagement at at that point before she and I met. And she looked at her phone, and she's like, "Motherfucker!" And the person, her ex fiance, had proposed to his new girlfriend the exact same way that he had proposed to that her. he had proposed to her, like like down to the detail of the place and the kinds of flowers and the arrangement and the experience and the surprise. Everything was exactly the same. And so it's this funny thing where it it can work both ways when you do that very familiar thing on repeat, that ritual, that ritual can, you know, people, even, even in a world of polyamory where nothing is supposed to be exclusively yours or rather one does not, one does not worry about the, the communal aspect of experiences, whatever the experience is, you know, one, one does not desire to take possession or ownership of any one thing. Uh, those kinds of rituals though, sometimes you have to, you have to keep something exclusive, right? To two people, to a to a bond, and yeah. you, and it gets diminished and cheapened significantly, if that just becomes just deja vu, or the same thing is done over and over. Right. Yeah. That I just I just I just keep thinking back to the music metaphor. I think that our relationships are and the road trip, they they are. Let them be metaphors, because. They are. When I say let but this not be a metaphor, the mean, whole point is, yeah, like don't think of a white elephant. Like, yeah. of course it's a metaphor. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I just, I just, I'm being cheeky. But 
So we want to we want to know how to drive. We want to know how to play. We want to know how to relate to each other. We want to come. You want the person that you're with in a relationship to have some of those skills. You definitely want them to have at this, in this day and age. You want them to have had a relationship before. You want them to have had sex before. You want them to be in touch with their sexuality. And at the same time, you want it to be completely new and fresh for you and your own experience that you're having with that person. And how to achieve that? There is no answer. There's there's a there's an attunement, hopefully, that 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 a that puts you in a position to allow for newness to emerge within the backdrop of a shared goal. That's probably a big part of it and a shared skill set and a shared desire for adventure, you know, like, but our brains love and focus on like this, this, this balance between contrast and similarity I find so interesting. So again, I've told this story before listeners, see if you can tell, uh, Marco Polo, right. Explorer, uh, Italian explorer went off his, his father and uncle had like traded in spices and all, all everything, everything easy to acquire. And there was the myth from Southeast Asia that there was a unicorn that had actually existed, right? And he went off in search of it and he was confronted at when he did, he had he had a verbal description. He had a written description of what it should look like and he thought he would find it, bring it back to Italy and it would be valuable because of its rareness, because of its specialness, because it wasn't a ritual. And he confronts a rhinoceros playing around in the mud, Southeast Asia. So the question is, how much of his previous expectation does he bring to bear on seeing a rhinoceros when he's searching for a unicorn, when he has a visual, dis- a verbal visual description of what it's supposed to look like, and then he encounters something that is 99% dissimilar, 1% similar. It has a horn sticking out of its head. That's it. What does a brain do with all that built up expectation when it confronts something new in violation of that expectation? He writes in his journals that unicorns are not as we had previously described them. Right. Not that he's not witnessing one, simply that we got it wrong, Very good, yeah. that it must be a unicorn and we just must have gotten some of the details wrong. And so when I meet a new person and I have some 99% expectation of what a relationship is supposed to be or what a dynamic is supposed to be or who I was most recently with, it's very, very difficult not to immediately compare to the experience, right? And and we we collapse on similarity sometimes much, much easier than we do dissimilarity. When we go to a new city, we try to say to ourselves, which part of this new city that I live in now or am visiting is most similar to the districts that I knew from my previous one? And it it it's it's like this there's more information in contrast than there is, I think, in similarity. If the world were one color, I mean, the easiest example, the world were just one color, how would we speak about objects and things? It would have to change. And so we very much need this like diverse richness of experience in order to, in order to get the most like landmarks and the most understanding out of the things that we encounter that are new. And then the better you get at something, the more you're able to make those distinctions. I wonder if, you know, if, if, if that guy ended up proposing to, you know, 20 girls like this, he would probably say, oh, each one was completely different. I right, promise. right. Yeah, because his <laughs> mental state is different, right? But on Insta- Instagram collapses so much. So even, I'm sure there's a version of your story that's now out there in the world of this weekend, right? What, what didn't mention, so uh, the, the movie Running Man, I believe, have you seen this with Schwarzenegger? I read the book, Stephen King, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it is. I'm not 100% sure of that. But yes, I, I, it's an adaptation. But um at the end, I think there's some sort of battle. Uh, I remember this kind of not entirely too well, but but basically a man is injured. He's complaining about his, his arm. It's somehow injured. And he has a commander, kind of like a military commander. They're coming in to save the day at the end. And the guy complains to his commander that his arm hurts. The commander takes a gun and shoots him in the foot. And he says, now how's, how's your arm? Which doesn't hurt at all anymore relative to the pain in the foot. And so the thing that you're Instagram story also left out is I had like a sharp barb in the bottom of my foot the entire weekend. And so all of my discomfort with respect to mechanical breakdown or, you know, like the newness of the experience or being lost in the river paled in comparison to like the eight out of 10 pain that I felt every single time I took a step. And what I realized though, is that I, so first of all, that was not captured on Instagram, right? Like the, nothing about that story captures the internal milieu of what's actually happening in people's minds. But it's also the case that my tolerance for all of the breakdown moments was made 
effectively flattened relative to the pain that I was actually like physical pain that I was actually in with each and every step. This is the entire weekend. The entire weekend, yeah. So, the, how are you telling these stories? It's it, the, the whole weekend is dominated by the pain in your foot. Well, but that's what I found so interesting that it completely framed the other kinds of discomfort, and it made them lesser than right. Like if I had had zero kind of immediate physical distress, <laughs> it, it those other things might have risen to the top. But so the, the arbitrariness by which you remember and and tolerate discomfort and uh, 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 like the, com the ambiguity of a, of an experience. It just gets encoded and remembered and experienced very, very differently. Yeah. Have we exhausted the, uh, the topic? No, I think we should explain a breakup in terms of mechanical failures. Yes. That's a good <laughs> idea. So yeah. And the difference between a break and a breakup, because there's a definitiveness to a breakup. Uh, you're saying yeah, I'm still, that's I'm, it. We're broken. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this uh, break, breakups, and breakdowns. So wh what is a break that's not a breakup? I, I, I know in relationship parlance, it's kind of meant to be like a temporary thing that might unresolve itself at some time. Uh, but every breakup could also, by definition, unresolve itself at any time. Right. That's what that people, and also when you're polyamorous, people are like, what do you mean you're on a break? Like, why not just be polyamorous and you keep going? The other so then what's on another relationship? So what does and it, it mean to you? It becomes semantic right. in, in, in the end. But and yet breaks, as we've said, are very important. If we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna think about it in terms of the car, right? Even though, like um, in Breathless, uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo says, "Oh, the cars are made to go, not to stop." Yeah. Um, but obviously, they also need to stop. So, I think again, a lot of this is semantic. A lot of it is a is a frame of reference. It's a way of seeing things that, in the end, reality butts up against it. So you could be on a break. And then end up speaking every day and then realize, okay, we're, you know, we're still connected. So what does it mean to be on this break? So it's, it's this nuanced idea of like, okay, well, we're already free, but we're going to be a little more free. Uh, we're going to have a separate experience. And yet we still want to fill the other person in on what's happening. So, and, and this is where you have this concept of relationship anarchy, which resonates a lot with me, which is the idea that we should stop having all these hierarchies and labels on relationships and, Maybe they maybe they impoverish the relationship more than they and they, you know labels and names give a certain stability, right? If you know this is my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, my yeah. it, it helps give it a, it's something to to hang your hat on, right? And it conveys a lot of information very quickly yeah. by virtue of its distinctions from other things, right? but also by virtue of its generality, yeah, right? Yeah, and so so then there's this idea of relationship anarchy, which says let's let each relationship be defined on its own terms. Uh, my relationship with you is unique and it's not, you know, a uh, podcast partner. That would be too reductive, right? Right. Or, 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 uh, Are you proposing? Because <laughs> this exact thing has happened before. <laughs> uh, no, so, so the idea that labels on relationships, I think, I think it's, it's one tool that we have, one, lick that we have on the guitar that allows us that's a backdrop onto which we can have newness and freshness but if we rely on them too much it starts to hurt it so and again each person has to find their own tolerance and desire but so a break a break up a break a break definitely feels more temporary than a break up a break down feels even more temporary still Right, um, a, a collapse would be the worst, I guess. A catastrophe. We didn't have any totaled. catastrophes. The relationship could get totaled. Yeah, and 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 our trip was full. Our adventure was full of, of 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 breaks and breakdowns, uh, but there was there were no catastrophes, which we were glad for. I don't think we ever won a catastrophe. No, not at all. No, I'm thinking about this totaled idea and how total just means it costs more to repair than it does than the no, value totaled, of the thing. Yeah, right? than the value of the things, which is not worth. But that's so anymore. sad if you bring that over into relationship domain and terms, like the idea that there's emotional intellectual currency that makes something, um, you know, not worth fixing. It just strikes it just strikes me as deeply sad. A the, lot of the idea see that it in infidelity. As, yeah, yeah. as something that's just totals a relationship. That's totals. Yeah, totals. Like, that's it. You broke it. 
like there's nothing that we can do to get back from this. Mm -hmm. And Esther Perel is great about this because she says we don't want to like minimize the pain that can be caused by a betrayal, but we should also possibly look at the potential for growth that is there. How many couples who do get past it then end up stronger than they were before, yeah. right? I, I wonder in my Nozick's experience machine of my version of the best possible life, my, you know, each one will, each person will have their own version of what counts as their best possible life to choose in this subjective experience chair. And I wonder like early on, do I have to get cheated with in order to appreciate, you know, cheated on, yeah. um, could be with, and, um, <laughs> Uh, in order to have a heightened appreciation later in life for something, right? Like if, if the point is uh, like an area, un maximal area under the curve for life across all of its ups and downs, or if the point is just maximum happiness at some point, at some future moment, but, these then, are different and people will, people will pursue different, different kind of curves. There, I, I met and interviewed the wonderful two women who wrote one of the kind of foundations of polyamory, a book called The Ethical Slut which was like big in the 90s. Um, and the, 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 the women who wrote it, Dossie Easton, um, I remember going up to her house and she said she realized how different her perspective was from the mainstream when she read an article online on some mainstream Cosmo or you know one of these like uh, you know magazines that a woman said she had, her husband had cheated and she had decided to forgive him and uh, and continue the relationship. And that a lot of the comments were from people saying she has no self-respect. How could any self-respecting person, you know, go back to this relationship? And and Dossie was like, I don't under even understand what how it computes that someone's self-respect has to do with a, what their husband has done to begin with. Right. B, the ability to move past it. Their capacity for forgiveness. Her capacity for <laughs> forgiveness. Like, it, it, she just said, I, there was just such a break, a, a chasm between my worldview and the mainstream worldview mm -hmm. that it was hard to even comprehend, right? So there are also these changing mores, right, that allow for different... Um, What's the word? The Overton window in politics, right? Like where you have a, a, a span of acceptable behavior and and points of view. And then that can shift a little bit. And that's more interesting than where you sit on the actual on, on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. certain points of view, fortunately, today, you know, don't make sense. And maybe one of the things Donald Trump has done is like, unfortunately, mainstreamed certain things that people before would have been ashamed to admit or maybe that's a good thing because it puts it in the light oh yeah we, we've basically imaged the tumors of our country now now we know how to now we know where to go if we need to resect them <laughs> exactly exactly so it's interesting in polyamory you have this idea that yes someone can have not only an affair but even potentially a whole other relationship and we can see what kind of growth can emerge from that when most people would be like that's a totaling event and uh i think one of one of our, our goals those of us who believe in like stretching the bounds of acceptability within relationships is to find these new areas within which growth can appear and that breaks and breakups don't and and infidelities and all these things get redefined in a way that we can have these novel experiences based on them and hopefully achieve points of view and vistas right. that other people haven't gotten to experience before and the knowledge of where the pioneering <laughs> up the river well and also but the knowledge of where the failure points are are i think is so important um with respect to the kinds of maintenance that are required Right. I mean, just knowing what can go wrong when, knowing when something has gone wrong previously for someone else, it's 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 this kind of useful institutional knowledge. And and I think so. Um, I've I've heard it said of poverty that poverty is effectively um, when it goes extremely well, it can appear to be fluid and working correctly, but effectively, when you're working so many jobs and you're taking the bus to work and there's just no 
there's no redundancy. So if any part along the chain fails of your life, yeah. if, if your car, if, if you, for some reason you can't get in the bus that morning, then you lose the job, which then you can't pay rent, which it's a cycle that spirals out of control based on a lack of redundancy, yeah. which is, which means that every point along the way is a failure point, which is not how to live. It's the, the, the worst way to live life. I mean, it's the hardest way to live life. And so the question is what parts of personal interactions do you wrap duct tape around? You know, yeah. like what parts do you anticipate are future fail points and is maintenance Maintenance can be really unsexy, but it's like really integral when you have failure points that have no redundancy. Yeah. And also, obviously wealth in this metaphor is having these things to fall back on, be it your own sense of self-worth, not yeah. just having it completely depend on the relationship, um, having a group of friends who and a community that believes in some of the same ideals that you do. Um, Absolutely. Someone who, who, by virtue of losing their primary partner, then loses a vast majority of their life and social interaction. That's yeah. a failure point. That is a poverty of richness in yeah. life when it's completely dependent yeah. on an individual. That's the radiator hose of, let this not be a metaphor. Well, we're an hour and a minute. <laughs> I don't think people, I don't want to test people's patience of listening to our voices i want to leave them wanting a little more <laughs> not like okay guys enough okay no more dear abby we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> bye. bye everyone